Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So it's now Sunday morning. I've been doing loads of videos recently. In fact, I've just realised that computer isn't quite in properly. That... Oh, I know why. That'll do it. Look, they're not even they're not even properly in. Right, okay, there we go. Right, so um what was I gonna say? So it's Sunday morning, um and last night or the night before I was doing some videos, so I thought I would do another video today, I'm just, you know, since I've started the whole philosophy and psychology on this channel, because that's what I've been immersed in so much, certainly for the past four or five months, but also way, way before that, uh, but obviously I just didn't do it on this channel, I've kind of like, you know, all this bubbling stuff is, is coming up. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about Zen. And Zen is a really horrible topic to talk about because you always feel awkward because it's something that, you know, a lot of the, the old Zen guys are like, don't talk about it and all this. And if you talk about it, you don't know Zen and all that stuff. It's a very awkward one to talk about because you constantly think, oh God, I don't want to talk about this because it's not, a, it's not meant to be talked about. But anyway, that's just how it is. So, um... I don't know much about the intellectual side of Zen. I know a few dates. I know a few of the Zen masters and things like that. From obviously, I've read quite a lot of the Zen stories, um, but I don't. I've not really read like uh, I think it's the Blue Cliff Record. Uh, I've read a little bit of the Gateless Barrier. I've read a little bit of the pa Platform Sutra. Um, I've really, I've not read that much. There's a couple of other little Zen books I've read. Um, I've obviously listened to practically the entire work of Alan Watts, probably twice or three times over. I've listened to hundreds upon hundreds of hours of Alan Watts. Um, so that gives you a kind of... It gives you a, a real well-rounded, inform, uh, informative view on Zen without really needing to read the old text specifically, although... Saying that, I do want to go back at some point in time when I've got a little bit of free time to be able to do the Zen stuff. Because the way I work it is, I've got alchemy to read. I've, I've read a few alchemy books, I've read a few texts of alchemy, but I really want to read more on that. I want to read a lot more of the Jungian stuff, obviously. Uh, not not necessarily just Jung's work, but um, Mary Louise Bott von Franz, uh, Lillian. Uh, well, oh, I can never pronounce, I always get it wrong. Anyway, Lillian, I'll just say Lillian, her first name, uh, who was a Jungian analyst. Um, you know, people like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I've got, God knows, loads of bloody other books to read. I'll see if I can see what, what I've got on this show. Oh, of course, some mythology books and stuff as well. And I want to go back and read a few of the old psychologists. I've read some Viktor Frankl, I've read some of his work, I've read, um, obviously Jung, I've read Freud, I've not read any Otto Rank, I've not, uh, I've read one book of Abraham Maslow's, but I want to read more of his, I've not read any Carl Rogers, or any Piaget, and they're two that I really want to, want to read as well at some point, so, um, but it's always the way, too many books, and you, you end up, you end up getting so many books, and you think, I'm never going to read all these in my lifetime, so what you, what I want to do at some point as well, is go through all my books, and then cut out half the crap, because there's like, I've got quite a lot of, I've got one up there actually, it's like a compilation book of philosophy, and I've got quite a lot of these kind of books that are, you know, I suppose they're great for an introduction, but there's not really, there's really not any point in reading those books, in, in my personal opinion, because you may as well just go direct to the philosophers and then think, right, I'm reading this guy, I'm reading that guy, I'm reading the other, and then you get an introduction to the work that way. And also, it's a harder introduction, so it challenges your your capacity, your mental capacity, to actually really think about these people, rather than if you're reading a, an introduction to philosophers in like a book uh, with one page dedicated to each one, you get kind of an understanding, it's a very basic understanding, and to be honest, in those sorts of books, you end up just forgetting it anyway. It might be okay for a little understanding in the here and now, but after a few weeks, or maybe after a few months, you've forgotten a lot of what you read, because there's so many philosophers in such a short book, you're just going to forget most of them anyway. So you may as well actually go to the um, philosophers 
directly and really do a, a good dive into their work and then you remember it more, it cements it more in your brain. Um, so yeah, anyway, I don't know what I was talking about. So, um, Zen, so I, I don't really know that much about the intellectual side of Zen. I just know the experiential side of Zen. As soon as I found Zen, I was like, yes, let's do this. You know, I wasn't like, oh, you know, let's read about all these bloody books. I, I, I want to do this. I want to get involved. And that's the, the most foolish thing you could possibly do in Zen. Um, so anyway, you know, you, you get involved, you get the experience. You go, oh, yeah, this is cool. So, you know, you... There's these levels in Zen, and, and you never stop, and as I said with the Taoist video, because Tao, Taoism and Zen are very, very closely linked, you, I could have done a video on Taoism and Zen together, because we might kind of repeat a little bit, I mean, I, I try not to repeat myself too much, because there is definitely other elements that I can talk about, um, but the, it, there's kind of these levels, and you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, and... and the koans reveal themselves to you. The koans are the problems in Zen, as I talked about on another video, the kind of the classic, what is the sound of one hand clapping, all that sort of stuff. So the koans reveal themselves to you over experience. So you'll have like what's known as a Kensho experience, which is an enlightenment experience. And that's your your first, everybody talks about this in spirituality. That's your first spiritual awakening. And that's the time in which you realize what, you, you, you have an idea of what existence is. You have an idea of what the universe is. Generally, it's a delusion in the idea of, uh, oh, everything's God. Because... You realize, you, it's weird, it's it's not intellectual knowledge, it's like you have this blow up of experience in a single moment, and it really is, it's in a single moment, your mind blows up in a single moment, um, or maybe over a few minutes or something, but it, it, it for me it felt like it was like literally just like a, a boom, and then it was, and I remember, I, walk, I swear on this evening, it was an evening, I walked outside and it was weird. It was bloody weird because I remember, I remember this part. I don't remember much of the experience, to be honest, which is really bad, but my memory is terrible. But I walked outside and I was like, whoa, I understand what all this is. Like, in a very deep manner, it was really, really weird. Um, but you get this delusion, first off, and then you work through, you keep going in your experience, you keep going in your experience, and uh, as I said, you go for a period of like six months or more. Well, it depends. It's going to be diff it's different for everyone. It's really it's different for everyone. Um, but you go for a period of where you're you're in these delusions, but also you're questioning what knowledge you've found. Well, if you're intellectual, if you're intellectual about your spirituality, then you're uh, questioning. If you have a in the psychology of religion terms, if you have a quest orientation within your religious pursuit, um, which just means that you're questing to find out the nature of reality or who you are or uh, what religion is specifically, what the truth is. Um, but no, so you question it and, and then you get some understanding and, and it's really good and, and I didn't really do this till a little bit later, but it'd be really good at that point in the journey to start reading some philosophy to ground yourself. Because spiritual awakening in its, in what it actually means intellectually is exactly the same as, as the philosophy of absurdism by Albert Camus. It's exactly the same as that. Absurdism says, um, you know, there's this, compulsion in humanity to find meaning but ultimately will never find any meaning and spiritual awakening although you get this very very deep understanding that the universe is god and you're a part of that and uh you know there's this kind of the universe is this system let's say and that's what the ancient people called god but actually it's not some god in the christian sense of the word or anything like that it's just literally the system and you you're aware of this system now and you're aware this is very much like living within the philosophy of alan watts but it is very true that's how it kind of is um but if you actually maybe critique that at that point of awareness and you think well hang on a minute we don't know that there's this thing called god or anything 
we, we start to understand actually what's happened is we've been completely familiar familiarized with the unconceptual now it's my personal view that the unconcept uh, this is part of my own philosophy that kind of branches off somewhat from Alan Watson, from Carl Jung and from people like that, um, that the unconceptual itself is God. Um, and it's nothing aside from God. Everything that is unconceptual could be categorized as what people in all of these... Re- if you go through all the religious traditions, there's this kind of idea that the unconceptual is God. Specifically, like, uh, in the Hindu tradition, um Specifically, like, there's, there's some things in Christianity. We have the idea in the book of Revelations, which ties to alchemy. So there's a, a passage in the book of Revelations that basically says, um, uh, I think it was basically at the seat of God, if I remember rightly. Now, I've only read this passage once or twice. It was like, in the seat of God, and there's this red stone in the seat of God. And that, like, represents God, let's say. Now, that directly re- uh, relates to the, uh, philosoph- uh, the Lapis Philosophic Theorem in Alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, and the Philosopher's Stone is the attainment of the unconceptual as uh, a freedom from the angst of a femoral existence, of your own uh, kind of individuality, your own specific body. Uh, it's the unconceptual and, it, and the unconceptual never dies. This is why uh, Mary Louise von Franz, um, she was talking about uh, an individual who had a dream about this big boulder and it was a big, I swear it was a big red boulder and it was in the middle of a forest and the forest had been burnt down and this person was actually told that he was practically going to die and uh, he had this dream before he died. And there was this big boulder and the forest got all burnt. And the forest, of course, the kind of the life energy, let's say, the the, um, the forest, the trees representing this kind of um, lightness, this life, this um, context of nature, of nature renewing itself, things like that. But we have like the boulder, which is the Philosopher's Stone, and this boulder, uh, after this fire, after everything's been burnt to ash, and there's no life left, and there's there's not really particularly any signs of renewal or anything like that within the dream, it's simply just everything's burned down into chaos, into the, the depths of despair and blackness, but we have the boulder that still remains. Now, what remains after death, or what remains... Um, after everything's been burnt down in life. Well, what remains is simply nothing. And nothing is the unconceptual. And therefore, the unconceptual is the thing that never dies throughout all existence, even throughout non-existence, even if the universe perishes, the unconceptual will still be there. The nothingness will still be there. And we see this throughout all these different traditions. It bleeds into Christianity. It bleeds into Islam. It bleeds in... Because there's a passage um, uh, in... Uh, I think it's the Quran. Uh, and it's talking uh, about Muhammad as well. But there's a passage in there. It bleeds into like things like dream time as well. Aboriginal dream time. It bleeds into so many of these... It, of course, Taoism, Zen, this is where it's most prevalent in. Um, but it bleeds into all these traditions. And um, and therefore, it's my personal contention that actually, this is the most bizarre take on God ever. But God is nothing. God is literally nothing. And I don't mean that as in God doesn't exist. I mean, God exists as nothing. I mean, literally, the experience of nothing is God. And this is... This is also talked about, as I've mentioned before, in the idea of Nerva Kalpa Samadhi, the pure awareness, the awareness without conception, the simply viewing reality as it is. Think about what's happened to us in life. What happens to us in life? We come into life and we create our ideas, we create our concepts, we create our words, we, uh, you know, primitively speaking, uh, speaking somewhat in the philosophy of Democritus when he speaks about the philosophy of language and how it uh, expanded out uh, from from practically nothing, how we became slightly more intelligent and then we started to 
produce sounds, just random sounds, or labeling things in, in a very, very primitive way. And then slowly over generations, we built up a, a language system that, that we can use now. Now, of course, within the psychology of language, that's a bit more debated in terms of there's many different angles that you can say on language. There's the, um, people who believe language is innate and then there's people who believe language is socialized and all this sort of stuff. So it's, you get into a bit more complex, complexification there, but you can see from a philosophical angle and from a, a very basic angle, how that would be how language progresses out of something. It starts with sort of nothing there and then it slowly branches out. And you can see this, um, in terms of primates as well. Like for example, all the other animal, all other animals only have a very, very basic, it's not even a language system, it's a system of communication, it can't be categorised specifically as language by our current definition of language, but they have little bits of communication that they do between, they, they have calls and they have uh, facial expressions and things like that in primates and they have little bits of communication in dolphins and elephants and things like that. But of course, their brains aren't, adva aren't as advanced as ours, so we can produce complex meaning, we can produce, uh, you know, sort of syntax and all this sort of stuff, and we can produce proper language. Um, and so if you look at it in that context and the evolution of, of animals in that context, then you can see that actually what's happened is that we've gone from very, very, very simple life forms that can't speak, can't do anything like that. And then it's differentiated itself, you know, because we all come from this one thing 3.5 billion years ago. And then it, the tree of life splits off in all different directions. And it's just the most wonderful thing, really. Lovely amount of diversity, lovely. It always, um, sorry, it always gets me a bit because when I speak of zoology and, um, Am I gonna cry? Oh God, am I gonna cry? No, no, sorry, it's okay, it's okay. It just gets me a bit because I really would have liked to do zoology and, uh, or, or something like that as well. Like, and I, I, I used to love watching, um, David Attenborough and Deadly Sixty and things. I used to love, I absorb them. And it, it's very odd, almost partially synchronized that uh steve backshaw actually is a lecturer here at bangor and that's really weird because but i mean it's not that synchronized actually it's very 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 likely from a just a normal causal perspective um but no but but it really excites me it really touches my love of life let's say when i think about this variety of species and we've got all these different species that have gone all down different uh, paths and you've got these species who have started to communicate and then you've got us who naturally as a follow-on from that have, have started to build complex language so we so we can see that there's there's something in that but we have this kind of idea that if we didn't speak if we didn't comment upon reality we wouldn't know what it is uh, it's very very true I only know what this computer is by the fact that I've labeled it as a computer and I've become familiar with that concept, with that idea of it being a computer. Oh, I'm happy to be around this computer. I'm not weirded out by it because I know it's a computer. Now, if we take away, if we strip away that conception, we can't really do that because it's ingrained in our brain too much. So even if I say, well, I'm not going to call it a computer, it's still familiar to me, you know, it, it's it's within my brain. I know that this is a computer and I've become familiar with it over years and years and years. But if we speculate on this and if we kind of withdraw that concept, let's say, in somewhat of a, uh, some, some sort of manner, we can think, well, yeah, I don't actually know what this is. It's only because we've built some familiarity with these concepts over an extended time period but I know what this is but ultimately I don't what actually happens is that we all come into existence we all start to produce these things we produce our you know I mean I've got a coffee here we produce tea and coffee and mugs and we uh, we create things based on our environment and we pull together resources and we put things together but ultimately, if we if we were all completely silent, and if we all still just did these things, 
we wouldn't know what it actually was. We wouldn't know what all this actually was. We'd just be doing it. We'd just be actively creating these things, but we wouldn't know what it was. And there's not, like, almost a weird element of uh, deity in that or divinity in that, in which like there's just this production and actually we name ourselves, we create our ourselves as ideas and we cement ourselves in reality in, in some form but ultimately behind that there's just this unconceptual that just goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on, even after the universe is dead, even if we're going to take the idea of proton decay, which I'm not a bloody physicist, I don't know whether it's true or not, or whether it's got some valid legs, personally I consider myself more of a poetic person so i don't really like to believe in proton decay but if someone says to me proton if a physicist comes up to me and says adam proton decay is completely real and all the rest of it and they've proved it fully i don't think they have actually proved it fully yet but if they say i proved, proved it fully well i'll say yeah i'll take that mate i'm not going to argue with you um because you're the you're the physicist at the end of the day i'm just the philosopher i have to take what is from all the other fields, what actually is factual, and I have to say, this is what it is, you see. I can't go against what people are saying if it, if it is scientifically validated, that would be just ridiculous. Um, so we have, uh, so even when the universe is decayed or gone down, or even let's say when the universe decays and then maybe it reforms itself or whatever in a cyclic universe or twister theory, like a Roger Penrose type idea, um, it's that unconceptual is still there. That, that, that base nothingness that's behind this experience is still there. It's always there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. What do you say to me? Well, well, isn't that a bit depressive that you're saying God is nothing? That God is like just this unconceptual. It, well, for one, isn't that just like absolutely insulting to all of religion? Yeah, I mean, it is in a way, but I'm a philosopher. You know, I, I like to... I like to bloody get a big mallet and hammer bloody conceptions down and I like to break through boundaries and I like to say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to take this information that I've gained from various different things. And if I see a link, which I'm a, I'm very, very high in openness, so I can see links and um, I'm like a philosophical link generator, basically, um, then I'm going to take that link and I'm going to put it into what I understand it is based on the best factual and empirical evidence that I have uh, and and so that's what I've considered and that seems particularly about right that God is nothing that God is the unconceptual and uh, God could exist as the unconceptual as the uncon well we could say God let's let's phrase it in this way God exists as the unconscious because the unconscious presupposes that there may be things within the unconscious that you don't understand, but that can't be negated. They can't be flat out said that they don't exist, but we are unconscious of our unconscious. Uh, we are not only unconscious of our own unconscious mind, but we're unconscious of anything that is not within our realm of knowledge. So anything we don't know about the universe is in our unconscious. You can say it that way in a more macro viewpoint of the unconscious. And so within that macro unconscious may lie something, some sort of thing, orienting principle, some sort of system, some sort of even subjective entity that we could so label God, but because it's unconscious, we can't ever prove it one way or another. It's a metaphysical question. We can't say one way or another. Um, so we could say that God is the unconscious. God is God is that. God is that which was before the Big Bang that produced the Big Bang, or God was the Big Bang. And then it orients all of our existence in the system, in the interrelated system of the universe, um, of which we have a uh, central ego control, an individual ego control, but that which taken as expressed as part of the system could be seen to be actually almost redundant and the system itself could provide some sort of basis for an argument towards fatalism. Yeah, I mean, I know that was a bit complex, but 
that's kind of what we could say. Um, but no, it, it, that's very weird. But anyway, so Zen specifically, we've got onto this idea of the unconceptual. Well, that's Zen. Zen is the unconceptual. Zen is the removal of knowledge claims. It's the uh, getting away from all these ideas, pushing away anything that's not real. It's like absurdism. It says, you know, absurdism's like, you know, there's a brilliant thing, there's a brilliant uh, philosophy that, that could be gained between the unification of absurdism and Zen. It could be called like Zen absurdism, although to be honest, the two are so alike that they're basically the same thing anyway, really, in a base nature. Um, uh, so you've got this idea of the unconceptual and Zen's throwing away all these knowledge claims. You say to me, this is what reality is. I'll say to you, no, it isn't. Or you, I say to you, this is what reality is. And you say, no, 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 it isn't. We're throwing away knowledge claims. We're getting away because we don't want them. We're like, they're like, uh, imagine you've got a lovely clean floor and then someone's spilt things on it and stuff. We're trying to bush away all the crap to get to the clean floor again. That's the unconceptual. That's the, that's the directing thing. That's the directing principle. That's the, that's the thing that is real, that is grounded. There's all these ideas, all this stuff. Any thought that you have in your mind isn't real. It's simply a comment on reality and uh, an idea that you've got, that you've gained, that you've, you've been conditioned into. This is why Alan Watts talks about the, the social conditioning, the, the conditioning that we go through, uh, that, that leads us to believe that concepts are real. And even in university, uh, although within the scientific tradition, as I've mentioned in another video, there's a brilliant, brilliant focus on getting rid of concepts. They don't go to the extent of getting rid of the concept of yourself. You see, that's what we need in science. We need, or that's what we need in university. We need a Zen teacher. We need, I mean, there are a lot of Zen lecturers out there. You know, I mean, I could name so many lecturers who are uh, really good in the field who are completely Zen. They've probably never even read any Zen, but they're just naturally Zen because you sometimes have these unconscious individuals who uh, were unconscious of Zen. They don't know about Zen, but they're, they're clearly Zen. So in Jungian terms, they're unconsciously individuated. Um, like Dr. Robert uh, Slabaski, I can never, uh, I can never pronounce anyone's name. Let's face it. But Dr. Robert Slabaski, uh, Slaboski or something, um, biological um, psychologist, I believe, or um, a neuropsychologist, uh, or neuro no neuroscientist, even. He's brilliantly uh, Zen, you know, absolutely brilliantly Zen. He might, he probably has heard of Zen because he's incredibly well read, but he might not have done, but he's kind of one that I would pull out. Um, but we want to get rid of these things. We want to kind of um, make it so that then we are centered and that we are rid of any conceptions. Why should I believe anything about reality? I've come into this world and all I've been, had from when I was born is my parents and my teachers and all these people telling me all these things that I am meant to believe about reality. Now those teachers and those parents and those friends don't hold any more information than I do. They never will. The greatest astrophysicist or the greatest scientist of all time, in the base of it, Although they will hold an incredible amount of intellectual knowledge, and therefore that presupposes that they understand reality in a more com complex and deeper manner, which is very true. But in the base of it, they are still, a sl in a way, a slave to the unconceptual. In the sense, talking about it in this way, as the unconceptual, as a childproof lock on reality. You can't ever make... A 100% valid knowledge claim, this gets into the philosophy of Kant with regards to so, uh, ideas like transcendental idealism and things that are inset within our nature a priori. Um, and therefore you can't make a 100% knowledge claim uh, on reality and therefore even those incredibly, incredibly intelligent people out there, top of the field, brilliant they still can't make that ultimate knowledge claim that says, this is it. And therefore, from an unconceptual angle, what they're telling me 
is simply an idea. They're telling me a comment on reality. They're not telling me something that is 100% grounded in fact because of the philosophy of Kant, because of the, uh, the transcendental idealism. Uh, and that was a brilliant leap forward in philosophy. Massive, huge, huge thing. I mean, it is basically Zen as well. It's a, it's a, it, it, there's a lot of Zen in like sort of ideas of Kant. Um, uh, so we kind of already knew it, but Kant brought it together in a way that was incredibly expansive, incredibly philosophical, incredibly rich. And so it, it cements it more as an idea. And it says, well, because ideas are powerful and ideas are, are, are very good. Ideas are, are brilliant things. Um, uh, but Zen calls for a removal of them. You don't have to remove them while not partaking in them. You, you can be Zen and you can partake in ideas and intellectualism and, well, not intellectually, but, you know, just, uh, being an intellectual and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you don't need to get rid of them completely. You can still be very much Zen within that realm. And uh, so many people have talked about this, you know, in the past. Um, so yeah, we, we have that idea. We have that idea. You know, why should I, why should I comment? So let's get back to the experience of them. So you go through the motions. So you start off. Let's, let's start off. This is, I need to drink my coffee because it'll be going cold. I bought some de Demerara sugar cubes actually. Um, I remember my grandma had some a couple of years ago or something. She, she got them out from, Biltons or whatever it's called, the brand. And I was like, oh yeah, sugar cube. I love the little Demerara ones, you know. I don't eat them anymore. And then, okay, I can't lie. I, I had one last night, but that only because I opened it up and I thought, I can't not just eat one. Because when we used to go to hotels when I was younger, I'm sure so many people did this when we were a kid. Up, well, I say kid, I mean more like a teenager. But, um, You'd, you'd get those little pots, right? The little metal pots on a, in a B&B. &B, and we'd put the sugar cubes in and, the, and we'd normally mix up the white and the, the Demerara. Of course, I used to like the Demerara most. That's why I got them to, uh, yesterday. But you'd always just steal a little sugar cube, you know. Anyway, so, um, what is it? So, uh, the experience. So, first off, you have, uh, so, obviously it isn't going to work like this for everyone. Uh, some people just think about Zen and be like, yeah, no, I can't bother with it. And that's fair enough. You know, go off and do what, what you want to do, you know, in life. There's no point doing something that you don't want to do or anything like that. Just do what you want to do. But you'll have this, um, I don't know, this compulsion. You may have this inquisitive instinctual compulsion. I've talked about that a lot. I talk about the instincts for inquisitiveness quite a lot because they're so aligned with, with who I am. Um, but you'll have this inquisitive compulsion. And so for me, what happened was over a period of 14 months or so, and I've touched on this briefly in other live, you know, live streams and stuff in the past, but I would watch Alan Watts and my God, did I get addicted to it. I mean, I was engrossed in it, entranced in it. Now there's this idea in alchemy within the magnum opus and the different, the four stages of, uh, again, I'm going to forget, Negredo, uh, Albedo, well, no, yeah, Grado, uh, Albedo, Citranis, and, uh, Rebudo. And I'm good, I butchered the pronunciations, I know. And also, alchemy isn't necessarily just the four step process. It can also be extrapolated out into a seven step process. It can also be extrapolated out into a 12 step process. Depends which alchemist you're looking at and all the rest of it but the magnum opus you can boil it down to these kind of four main processes and this the magnum opus is the work of the great work of the alchemist of getting to the philosopher's stone and the philosopher's stone in a spiritual sense is the attainment of the unconceptual which as it, as in my own kind of understanding of all these different traditions is the is kind of the attainment of the ultimate uh, knowledge, the ultimate insight, which then could be in line with some sort of idea of God. Um, uh, and also we can say things like the unconceptual is things like omnipresent, um, uh, is om omnipotent and all these ideas that go along with God. You also understand when you get insight into, you know, this idea I was saying that the universe is God. When you get 
insight into that in the first spiritual awakening, you also realize that all those concepts that you were taught in very, very basic religious studies, the fact that God's omnipresent and all this, well, actually that's true because if God is the universe, then everything in the universe is God, then that means he, he, well, I say he, sorry, it is all seeing because the coffee, the, the, the particles in this coffee, the energy in this coffee, the energy in me, all of this is God basically folding in on, in on itself. It's like this weird system that folds in on itself, like one of those um, rubber bands. You know those rubber bands that you get that fold in? There's a word from them, but I forgot. But there's a rubber band that folds in on itself like that, and it's like partially inside and partially outside itself it's weird it's really weird but it's like that it's kind of like that um so god is all seeing god is all powerful in that sense if you you think about it in that sense also there's the idea of the cities now the cities in spirituality are uh powers spiritual mystical powers that you can attain the ability to move objects with your mind telekinesis the ability to to move fire or to control water, the ability to shrink to any size you would like to, the ability to grow to any size you would like to. There's all these different uh, city powers that come to you uh, in spiritual enlightenment. Now, it's my contention, and it was interesting when I thought about this idea, that that isn't the case from an individual perspective. Now, there are people who claim to have these city powers. Even recently, like 30 years ago, there was someone who claimed to have these city powers. And I'm not going to say one way or the other. They might be true, they might not. Personally, I'm a little bit speculative, but they might be true, they might not. That's what we're going to say. But think about it this way, about the city powers. Imagine that God, we're going to go down this idea that God is the universe. All of those city powers align directly to that. Okay, so let's say the ultimate energy of the universe is God. The ultimate energy of the universe, from a scientific perspective or from a religious perspective, whatever perspective you want to take, it changes. It can change form into different things. When, when, I go and eat something, I eat something and then it changes form into me and some of it will get excreted out as well, the waste matter, and then that's a change in its state. It's just like Heraclitus in, in fragments. The idea, of course, that a man can't step in the same river twice and so everything's changing, everything's flowing. Um, it's a nice little book, Fragments, actually, although uh, when I read it, I was like, you know, some of the bits are a bit frivolous and, you know, superfluous and stuff for a bit added for a bit addition additional really it doesn't even need to be the, the size of a book that it is um but anyway uh you know there's this idea that things things are changing and things are um moving along and so in these city powers if you think about it if you get this knowledge that god is the universe and you're a part of that then in attaining that knowledge, you realize that this energy now that's going to change form and going to do all different things over an extended time period is going to be able to be infinitesimally small, is going to be able to expand itself to an incredibly large degree. It is going to be able to change fire because this energy in my form, the energy that's being utilized by me right now, when I die, it might at some point pass on to becoming fire. And in that, in that ecological um changeability let's say then i do well not me i don't but the energy gets the ability to control fire the energy gets the ability to control water because it becomes water and so in an ecological viewpoint there's the city that's the city and it's, it's genius and we get this idea in uh aboriginal dream time so in dream time uh there's oh it's a very very rich tradition it's the most and it just like zoology, this gets me a little bit emotional because dream time, along with the Native American traditions of spirituality, in my opinion, are the most advanced and the most elegant forms of spirituality that we have on this planet. And they need to be upheld because they are so refined so elegant and so beautiful 
In Dreamtime, we have this idea of inside and outside knowledge. We have the clever men and the clever women, the, the Marble and uh, Marburn, I think they're called as well. And um, the youngsters don't get inducted into the inside knowledge of this is the inside spiritual knowledge. There's exoteric knowledge, the outside knowledge, and there's esoteric knowledge, the inside knowledge. The old clever men and clever women, they have the inside knowledge. They are spiritually awakened. They have gone through all the levels of the process. They're like the um, shamans of, of, the, of the group. Now, the youngsters only get inducted in youth into the uh, exoteric knowledge, the, the outside knowledge. And the knowledge, interesting, interestingly, is symbolised on trees at different locations. And some of the bark of trees is remained on the tree, and other bark is ripped off and is pulled off to represent the inside knowledge, you see. The, the bark is ripped off, that's the outside, that's the external knowledge. But on certain trees, the inside knowledge is there from the bark being ripped off. And of course, within the Aboriginal tradition, the land is synonymous with you. And it's an ecological viewpoint because we, of course, are, we come from the land. We come from Mother Nature, if you want to give it a name. We, we, we are a part of that and we are indebted to that and we are bound to that by our physiology. I need the land because it produces my food. I need the land because it produces my shelter. I need it. It is me in that sense. It is me within that sense because it flows through me in food and I pass that out and then that goes back into the water system, water cycle and then it goes round again, produces more food and then I eat that again. It is a part of me, it's cyclical. It is the Ouroboros, the, the ancient Egyptian symbol for the, the oneness of planet Earth, the ecology that goes round like that in a circle. And uh, so there's this, you know, very, very fixed idea that the land is sacred. So we have all these little sacred routes that they have to travel. They have to do things or they have to make sure that they're being respectful on the sacred paths. They are very, very, very aware of not taking anything from the environment that they shouldn't do. Of course, like certain things like food and stuff, that's okay. But not to displace any rocks or anything like that, or any specific parts of the environment. They have this idea of sorry rocks, which are rocks that have been taken from the, the, the land, from the, the ancient land, by people who don't understand the culture, don't understand the traditions. And these are taken, in, in modern days, these are taken by tourists. What do you do when you go to the beach when you're on holiday? You take a rock. But what you're doing is you're taking a rock from its rightful place in the environment. The environment as a whole, as a macro system, has placed it in that position. In the philosophy of De Democritus in uh, 300 BC, the Greek philosopher, who I touched upon earlier, he had this idea that the universe is a system which places things in their correct position based on a sieving system. He, he draws the analogy of a sieve. So when... Uh, yeah, yeah, sieve is the right word. I was trying to think of another word then. But when you sieve something, certain things get lift, left in the sieve. And the things that get left in the sieve are those that are a very, very similar size, similar elk, let's say. So, and, and the things that go out of the sieve, again, are a similar size because of the holes of the sieve being a certain size. And so imagine, uh, he draws this analogy of the sea where the seal push rocks up onto the onto the beach and these pebbles and these rocks will all be of a similar size, a similar vein, let's say. They'll be in a similar vein. They'll all be collected together. And that's an environmental factor. That's an environmental, a universal factor that therefore shouldn't be impeded. And so that's the principle in a more, well... It's not completely a scientific manner, but it's more of a philosophical manner uh, rather than simply a, a religious idea of it or a, sp or a spiritual idea of it. But there is a sort of a universal uh, law behind this that actually should possibly be respected. And you can start to 
become more appreciative of dream time or of the Aboriginal tradition if you think about it in other terms that are more familiar to yourself rather than just simply a religious or spiritual tradition that's removed from your own understanding because of your cultural upbringing. So anyway, in um, Aboriginal dream time, we have this kind of tradition. and the, I, I don't know where I was really going with this. I, I forgot where uh, uh, where I was particularly going with the whole idea of Aboriginal dream time and what it particularly relates to. But they have this uh, idea of the rainbow. Set. Oh, I know. I remember now. I was relating it to the whole dream idea. So I was talking about the, the changing in... Uh, ecology and how my energy will naturally become something else. So in dream time, we have the idea of the dreaming. Now the dreaming is a very, very, very complex com uh, concept and it's full of what I like to refer to as like sort of juice and spiritual tasty morsels. I say it for poetry as well. Uh, you know, when you get a really good poem and it's just juicy and lovely and tasty. There's a sort of spiritual juice that flows with dream time. That just, you can't get that excitement anywhere else, but dream, that intellectual or that spiritual excitement quite anywhere else. So personally, for me, I can't, uh, except maybe the Native American tradition, like I said, there's just a certain spiritual fervor to it. And uh, anyway, so they have this idea that we all have our dreaming um, and that our dreaming is related to a certain animal, so you could say it's a spirit animal. And those who, the Aboriginal Australians who lived in the swamps, their dreaming may be related to the crocodile, and so that would be their, their spiritual animal, and there'd be certain symbolisms associated with the crocodile, and uh, that that would be like, like sort of a, uh, a, a life bond, if you will. It's kind of like a, a certain... Uh, spiritual bond to the land uh, because the land of the swamps is relating to the crocodile and you've been brought up in that land and so that animal is therefore within your ecological environment and therefore it's tied to you in some regard and so you've got that idea um, and obviously all these different people would have different different dreamings would different have these different animals and they would maybe come to them in dreams they would be there present in actual actual dreams now the god in aboriginal dream time is something called the rainbow snake very nice idea and of course you could tell how i love it because you can see by my branding i'm all about rainbow so when i heard rainbow snake this is incredible now there are parallels to be drawn between uh quetzalcoatl um and uh kukul Kala i can never say it i can never say it Kakalkulan or Ku Kul Kalkan. Kul Kalkan, I think it is, but that's not the right pronunciation. But it's like K U L K A K A N, I think. And these are the Mayan and the Aztec um, sort of uh, snake gods, feathered serpents. Now, it's known that the rainbow snake isn't feathered in modern parlay, let's say. But actually, traditionally, the rainbow snake in Aboriginal dream time was feathered. So we have this weird um, collective unconscious parallel between dream time and their, their god and their feathered serpent. And over in uh, South America, the uh, ideas of the gods, uh, of the feathered serpents over there. Now... Well, you're going to say to me, of course, it's it's, it's diffusionism. Or uh, Now, I always get that word wrong. I think it's diffusionism. I think that's the word I'm looking for, which is where humans in their early migration, of course, we came from Africa and we expand, expanded outwards, um, possibly about, I, I read it in a history book not long ago, but I can't remember quite exactly how long. A hundred thousand years is probably going back a little bit too long, but certainly over in Australia, the humans made it over there about 50, 60,000 years ago. So we could say maybe between 60 and 80,000 years ago, it might be between 60 and 100,000 years ago, but we started to migrate out of Africa and go for Europe and, you know, and obviously expand into these lands. But what happened is it's not a diffusionist argument, this idea of the 
the two um, the two mythologies, let's say. And diffusionism is the idea that basically all mythologies of the world um, they have connections between cultures, and so therefore there can't be anything of uh, these things individually arising as ideas solely on their own. It's actually that maybe someone from over here got a boat and went over here and then introduced this to this culture and therefore it's just a, a naturally causally arising mythology because of such traveling but the weird thing is as far as i can tell from the research that i've done the aboriginal australian idea of the rainbow snake and it really does seem like this because the amount of looking into this I've done and realising the time scales, it just doesn't work, it just doesn't align up. Um, the Aboriginals and the Native Americans had no contacts and it actually says that, well, it's, well it says that the Native Americans had no contact and it says that the Aboriginal Australians had no contact even just in the, the history book that I, that I was reading not long ago. But aside from that, I've done other research to really solidify my foundations. I, I looked into the history of boats and things like that to see if we could see if there was any contact whatsoever. Could there have been any contact in it? Really, between these two civilizations, no. With other civilizations, Egypt had a big influence, a big influence on Greece, for example, things like that. We can save as connections there, and therefore it's the diffusionist argument is present. And that's perfectly fine, because I don't refute the, the diffusionist argument. I, I think that actually it's quite a powerful argument, and it should be respected. But we have this idea that these two uh, civilizations didn't have any contact, yet they arose the same gods. And it's not like these gods are just like people. These are really quite odd gods. They're feathered serpents, and they're quite distinct. Now, of course... I'm going to ground ourselves here and we're not going to say it's some sort of synchronicity or, or particularly the idea that there's that kind of like an a-causal connecting principle there rather than causality. I think it's more causality because, well, we've got over in South America, I'm sure there's snakes over in South America, certainly like in the, uh, yeah, there will be in the, in the uh, rainforest and things like that. So they'll, they'll have had snakes and then they'll have thought, oh, the snakes are very powerful animals and probably some of the members of the tribe at some point had got killed by snakes so it's inevitable and therefore they think well we'll, we'll revere it as a god so they revere the snake as a god and they maybe add feathers to it and they pump it up a little bit and they pump it up in the stories and make it really good and all the rest of it and the same is true over in australia because there's snakes there and that's what happens but it's very interesting that that these two mythologies align but getting back to this idea, the rainbow snake, and moving forward with this ecology idea, um, it's very, very interesting, very, very powerful, because the rainbow snake is the thing that provides people with their dreaming, and it provides people with their dreams as well. It's like um, the great man over in the Nescapi tribes in the Lab Labrador Peninsula, where the, in the Labrador Peninsula, the... the the members of the tribe believe that the great man, which is the man who orients all of us, again, we could compare this with the universal energy, we could compare this with Christian ideas of God and stuff like that, although, you know, it's a loose connection in a sense. But, you know, you can you can get the connection there. So the great man is the thing that provides all the, all the little men or all the normal men with, with their dreams. And the member of the tribe, and this is what Carl Jung talks about in Man, Man and His Symbols, it's a very, very interesting passage, actually, from Man and His Symbols. Um, he talks about this idea uh, of the shamans being the friends of God, um, and they're closest to the great man. They're closest, the shamans are always the closest to the great man, man because they're the, the spirit people in the tribe, they're the members of the tribe that have a connection to the great man, have a more spiritual and deep connection to the spirit realm, which we could now categorize in psychological terms as the unconscious, as the, the realm of dreams and fantasies and ideas and the realm in which all of this is created from. We have ideas that spring to our conscious mind from the unconscious and then we end up creating computers in reality or we end up creating coffee mugs in reality from an idea that sprang from the unconscious which could so be then 
aligned with the spirit realm in a sense, ideas having a spiritual context, or uh, maybe not a spiritual concept, con uh, context as such, but uh, an enigmatic existence, an enigmatic idea that just springs to mind. But anyway, the, the friends of God are the ones with the powerful dreams, and the Nescapi believe that the if they write down their dreams or if they draw their dreams, if they interact with their dreams and try and understand them in the context of their life and maybe that will provide some sort of uh, reward or something within their life which will be important and will, which will be spiritually important, um, then the great man will bestow them with more dreams and then they'll be able to progress spiritually in a sense. And so that's a, that's a very, very powerful idea, not just from a spiritual sense, but from a, you can even see this in a, an idea of the law of attraction. You see, the law of attraction is buried in all of these spiritual, well, not all of these spiritual traditions, but in some of these spiritual traditions where we have this idea, we concentrate on this manifestation, and then it, we produce it in reality. Uh, and, and so we kind of do this somewhat in the law of attraction. But it's a very, very powerful idea, and it's something that, um, obviously, then moving forward, we we have this um, idea of uh, things, you know, progressing spiritually and being able to uh, move forward in such a way. And there is certainly like psychological basis, to, like valid psychological basis to it in terms of positive thinking and having these ideas, and then having an idea and then simply moving forward in your life to pursue that idea it's nothing crazy it's not some sort of weird spiritual thing really it's it's actually it can be categorized more scientifically if you'd like or it could be categorized more spiritually it just depends on your way of way of thinking but getting once more going back to the dream time idea the rainbow snake being the producer producer of dreams so there's this idea, the, the inside, the esoteric knowledge of dream time, the, the knowledge that the clever men and the clever women of the tribe, and that's literally what they're called, the clever men and clever women of the tribe understand, but the youth don't understand. Now, the youth don't understand it because it's not conducive to success for the youth to understand this knowledge. Now, I've been involved with spirituality at a young age. 21 was when I started to, you know, think about it. I'm coming up to 25. Now, from my experience, it's probably not so good to indulge in spirituality at that age. Um, for a long time, I thought probably it was but now I think, hang on, I kind of understand these traditions more and I understand exactly why the young people shouldn't have access to the spiritual knowledge. They're too spirited. That's what it is. They're too spirited. They're too egoic. They're too, let's get life. Let's go out there and do things. Let's be a person. Let's try and do these things. That's why in the Hindu tradition, they have the idea of the Vana Prasta. Uh, Vana Prasta, I can never say it, Vana Prasta, um, and the Sunyasa, uh, which are the two stages, four stages of life, and the two uh, remaining stages of life, later stages of life. The Vana Prasta being someone who is renouncing household life, and the Sunyasa being like a, um, a wandering sort of, in a way like a hermit, but also like a sage, almost like a wandering sage as well. Someone who doesn't have a home, someone who doesn't have a name. They generally call them, uh, they take up another name. Sometimes they'll take up the name of, of Swami, as Alan Watts has talked about this. They'll take up the name of Swami and uh, and they'll become Swami da da da, Swami this, Swami that or whatever. And Alan Watts also talks about in a, a bit of an ob obscure uh, lecture actually I don't know what lecture it is but it's a it's a more of an obscure one and he actually says uh, what Swami means and Swami according to him at least I've not researched this myself but I have uh, you know obviously I believe him because um, he was incredibly well read on all of this stuff so I have no reason to doubt but Swami means the bliss of Brahman and Brahman of course in the Hindu tradition is the ultimate reality the, the Godhead, essentially, which it, it, 
has three as aspects to it. The destroyer, the creator, the preserver. Brahma, the creator. Shiva, the destroyer. Vishnu, the preserver. And we can also align that to our own existence as well in the idea of God being the universe. The preserver being the food within ourselves, eating food, preserving ourselves, ourselves preserving themselves essentially. The destroyer, our inevitability of death, the fact that we have to die. Um, and then the creator, the fact that we all have, well, not all of us, but the majority of us, fortunately, have the ability to create new life. And so, in a sense, we could... Uh, bring those concepts in Hinduism into the idea that the universe is God and we are a part of that and that we align with those three aspects of of, uh, of, of the divine play, of the Vishnu Leela, the, the uh, idea that we're all living in this uh, dream world, this uh, play that goes on and that's created from, from the fantasies of Brahma. In fact, there's brilliant stories, I'll tell you in a minute actually, about one of the brilliant stories about Brahma and the creation of certain certain gods from him. It's a, it's a lovely little story. It's in The King and the Corpse by Joseph Campbell. Well, not Joseph Campbell, uh, Heinrich Zimmer, but Joseph Campbell edited a lot of it. And in fact, if you read the uh, autobiography of Alan Watts, because Alan Watts was fairly close friends with Joseph Campbell from 1950 onwards. He, Alan Watts met Joseph Campbell in uh, the Christmas of 1949, 1950. I think it was 1950. Um, and they got on really well. Uh, and um, uh, and so they were close friends. And Alan Watts talks about how Joseph Campbell actually pulled together quite a lot of that book um, because Henry Zimmer, who Joseph Campbell looked up to Henry Zimmer as um, as someone you know as someone who uh, he respected. And Henry Zimmer died unfortunately and and couldn't get quite to finish it. And so Joseph Campbell edited it and put some things in. And 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 the stories are very much typical of that Joseph Campbell romantic vibe that he has in his literature because of course he he was he, he very um kind of good because he was he was involved with literature um he's a student of literature and so he has a very good vibe with his words and stuff like that does he get a little bit too into the whole idea that you're god and all the rest of it in some of his books yeah um and he maybe goes down the route of touching with bits of inflation there and stuff as well but it's always the way with anyone spiritual and I'm not going to deny that in myself or in anyone else but there's always those little elements of uh, ego inflation or delusions of grandeur because you've seen this idea that the universe is God and so you or the unconceptual is God and so you get this little twinge in your eye that says I know something that some of us don't and so you you have to tame that that kind of inflation there and realize that actually you are just an ephemeral human an individual exactly the same as everyone else everyone else is exactly god as well in the idea and that uh we're all interacting we, with each other as equals and as that and so you don't then then therefore you can start to realize that the day-to-day -day existence is to be appreciated as uh a uh, uh, kind of on one side, normality and within the divine play, but on the other side as this kind of dance of God. And so you can have that in your mind and you can laugh about it. And there's a lot of laughter in spirituality. Um, so you, you've got this kind of um, dance, you know, going on and you've got this kind of idea of, uh, you know, thinking about this and you just always constantly laugh. I mean, the amount of times I laugh during the day just because I think, oh my God, this is so weird because we're, what we're doing here in life is mythologizing our lives. I am a myth. I am the myth of Adam Robinson or the myth of Ads Robinson. And it's so, solely my job in life from a, from a, from an absurdist perspective to simply create the most ridiculous and weird and crazy myth I can while trying to still live out in the framework of society because of course there's no point going off into the mountains or doing things like that or trying to um push against society in a um a rascal guru approach like uh drunk uh, i can never pronounce his name again again i never pronounce anyone's name right uh i mean it's drunk per kinley uh I think he was lived in like the 14th, 15th century, and he was a mystic. Uh, he was a rascal guru, and of course, he got the knowledge that he was God. And what he would do is he'd just do anything. He'd do anything spontaneous because he knew that 
spontaneity is in line with the Godhead because what people do is they get a spontaneous thought and then they start going over it in the mind and they start getting anxious and they start getting worked up or you know maybe it's a particular thought that maybe isn't very nice or that isn't or that maybe uh, you're just anxious about something and then that's getting out of the flow of the spontaneity of of, of the whole system of the universe but you know in a way this is the Tao, this is the way of the universe, the spontaneity of it, the flowing with the thoughts, the getting a thought and then flowing with it. So, um, you know, what you do is because there's spontaneity in thoughts and there's divinity in the spontaneity of thoughts, is every thought, well, no, you wouldn't necessarily do this, but this is my idea of what I think he was doing based on what I know but actually what he would do is he'd just do random spontaneous things and of course what would have happened in his mind is a thought would pop up and he'd just end up doing it so it, it, it was very there was a lack of morality of course there was some terrible things he did absolutely terrible things he did uh, it's the same with the, ras- the modern rascal gurus um, De Love Ananda in the, in the 70s I've talked about that before and uh, Gorjeff um, George Ivan Gorjeff who uh, had his little retreat and would bring people there and he'd, he'd make people who were vegan meat eaters there's a lot of this in uh, uh, George Feuerstein's book, book The um, Holy Madness if you want I was looking for a book on rascal goers because you know, I like to consider myself a bit of a rascal and um, I wanted a book on, on, on rascal goers but I couldn't find one so um, I went to, to George Feuerstein, I managed to find that one, and there's a lot of, about uh, Gore Jeff and De Love and Andrew in that, and my God, some of the stuff they did to, to get people out of the ego, so to speak, and to to kind of remove the the compulsions of people on an emotional level from the attachment of of um, of the world and not being able to flow with thoughts. Uh, you know, there was a lot of like, uh, I'm going to have sex with your wife kind of thing going on, so then it would. Uh, get people out of the emotional attachment for that person and then end up making them more or potentially more egoless in the process now from a modern psychological viewpoint that's incredibly harmful um there's better ways of being a rascal go there's better ways of going about it um you know in modern psychology the whole exposure therapy has come from you see, we don't get taught this in psychology, and it's ridiculous. People in psych- who are psychologists think, a lot of them, think that the history of psychology stops at, like, 1850 or 1870, when, like, the first major psychological institution was, was built. Um, but it, it doesn't. It goes way, way back to the Zen guys and to the spiritual guys and to Buddha, to Buddha even, a Buddhist idea. There's a lot of psychology in Buddhism. Um, but you know, a lot of these psychologists, you know, to be to give them credit, a lot of them do know this as well. There's a lot out there who do know it, but there's a lot who don't. Um, but exposure therapy, which is essentially the the rascal goes idea, but just confined into a more morally suitable idea for the 21st century in a more incremental step based procedure, which actually has been found in scientific studies to be much more beneficial for mental health than the kind of more deep exposure therapy where you just throw someone in at the deep end, like for example, um the trying to get someone out of attachment of the ego um by sleeping with their wife and having them cry at the side, having to watch such an experience because they're incredibly attached to their wife and they love their wife quite rightly and they have to experience her gaining some pleasure from some random guy it's like the most horrible thing ever there's better ways to do things like that and also it presupposes that um you you can't that you can't be unegoic in a relationship or in a, an attachment to a relationship you see you very much can be it's very very zen in fact to have a marriage um it's only the attachment to such an idea if that were to fall down that then is is the thing but you see it's not even the attachment to the thing that that is the thing because it's very very zen to cry it's very very zen to be anxious and you only learn that when you get to a certain level of awareness of zen but it's very very zen to be anxious very very zen to cry the thing is because it's all about spontaneity with zen this is how you do it you have an external stimulus that comes in let's say a breakup someone wants to break up with you and you have this natural spontaneous 
feeling of crying. Just like when someone dies or whatever, you have that natural experience, spontaneous experience of crying. You let that come in. You let that take a hold. You let that fill you up with experience. But as soon as that external stimuli has lost its effect, has lost its power, then you go back to being centered again. Now, this is what most people don't do. They attach themselves to the thought of the breakup and they constantly go round and round and round until they're sat on the bed, they're, I don't know, they're eating ice cream in the kitchen, they're doing this, they're doing that, and they're constantly getting down and down and down and down about it. And then that's not quite flowing with the down. Now, also, that is flowing with the Tao. This is the weird paradoxical thing about Zen and the Tao and stuff. Because you can never not flow with the Tao. So even if you are anxious or you're, or you're even getting out of Zen, you're still within Zen. And, and, and so it, it takes a lot of being anxious and being totally in doubt to actually understand that. Because ultimately, you're always flowing. Ultimately, there's external stimuli and spontaneous things coming from inside you or, or, or externally to you uh, in terms of innate processes like instincts or from external stimuli coming in all the time to push you into a flow and to keep you going through life. Even if you try for the longest time period possible to attach yourself to a thought, it will go, it will vanish. So you are automatically Zen straight away in your base existence. And so that is the end of the great doubt when you realize that because the great doubt in Zen is you build up this doubt of I'm not Zen, I'm not I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know these cons. I don't know what I can do. I don't know whether existence is suited for me. I don't know what all this existence is. Wow. You know, I, I can't, I'm not as good as these old masters. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm just a student. I'm done. You know, all these questions, all these things. I can't do this. I can't do it. Um, it's upon going through those follies, through those follies, through those follies, through those follies. And then you boom, 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 boom. And you attain it. And then there's no doubt. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, there's no doubt. Now, personally, for me, there's doubt. I doubt still. I doubt all the time. Doubt about bloody. I doubt about whether this bloody coffee is hot for one. Jesus. It's lukewarm. It's not too bad. But there's always there's always doubt there. You know, it doesn't matter. But um, so this is the this is the experience, and this is you go through the koans. But just very quickly to backtrack, because unfortunately, the way my mind works is it's so. Boom, 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 boom. As you, as you're all aware, all of the regulars who are watching this, I, um, I just go for one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. And drinking coffee is the worst thing, you know. You know, boom, boom, boom. Um, but anyway, so, um, the Aboriginal Dream Time, the idea of this, uh, idea of changeability in ecology within Dream Time. So within Dream Time, um. There's this idea you can get these uh, collective dreams in the Jungian tradition. It's uh, archetypal dreams um, that give you insight into the dreaming, into understanding the dreaming. And, and what these are, are, I've had them. I've had visions of these as well. I had a vision once where I was like looking at a fish and then... I went like inside the eye of the fish. I went like right directly in, in, in this vision. Went directly into the eye of the fish. And then I saw this monkey swinging on the trees. And then I went into this monkey. And I was like this person sat in an airport next to this other person. And then this other person had a heart attack. And I went into his eye. And then some other animal came out of that. Now what that fantasy is, it's an incredible powerful fantasy. What it is trying to tell you is the changeability in ecology and the fact that the energy changes and your energy changes into something new. The fish at some point ultimately, whenever, will change into another animal. Maybe not, let's say, a monkey, but it'll change into another, it might change into a monkey, but it'll be some other animal. Some That energy, that energy that was there in that fish present, it'll disperse into ecology and it'll change into, it'll, little bits of it will dispense into other things. And the man who has the heart attack within his eye lives the the causal potential, shall we say, the causal potential in his eye for that energy to 
be something else you see so that's how dream time works and i have a word for it i have a phrase for it it's called ecological changeabilities in consciousness and it's the scientific version or well i like to think of it. it's not the scientific version of reincarnation because scientists won't ever entertain that idea but it's the philosophical version of reincarnation, shall we say, instead of the religious version of reincarnation. The philosophical viewpoint that ecology is changing, that our energy changes, and that we go into something else, and that we create our, um, we create a new being from that, and there is some level of consciousness there. I won't remember this consciousness. I might have been a velociraptor 65 million years ago. In fact, I had a vision the other day in which I was taken back through some sort of weird time stream, and then I saw a velociraptor. So you never know, my the energy I'm utilizing now could have been a velociraptor at some point, and, and it, it simply just differentiated itself into me again. In, uh, well, not me again, but into me, uh, through this this consciousness and I'm having this consciousness now um, and then it continues on and on and on but you never realize that it's this eternally changing thing so just like physiology changes so does consciousness when you, so like for example in this in this idea let's say because we don't want to get bogged down in too many ideas here because that really isn't that then but in this idea just as our physiology breaks down, we know this, breaks down and changes into something else and gets dispersed into the environment and maybe part of it goes into uh, creating another animal. Then just as that changes, so does our consciousness change and renew itself into something else. It's, it's quite logical. It's quite a logical philosophical argument. Um, again, I don't think really scientists entertain it too much because they can't do, there's no, the problem is, there's no way to prove it scientifically, it's not, it, you know, there's no way, it, it's something that can't be proven scientifically, so it's a hard one, but I'd love to prove it scientifically. So in dream time, the exoteric teachings, are, uh, first off, dispense to the children in children's stories, and I've got a book up there, actually, well, let me, let me get this uh, story out, because it's, it, it's in here, and, uh, uh, it's in here somewhere. I'm probably going to not be able to find it now. It's actually probably right at the back. Ah, here it is. So, this is uh, The Butterflies and the Mystery of Death, which is a uh, an Aboriginal Dreamtime children's story. Well, it's just an Australian children's story, really, but it has links to Dreamtime, you see. Um, right, so basically... There was a cockatoo, and this was the first instance of death in this story. Death had never happened before, and there was this cockatoo that died. So, uh, they were saying that the animals were puzzled, right? And so they decided to call a meeting to discuss what could have happened to Gingy, which was the cockatoo, the first instance of death. First, they asked Uriel, the owl, to give his explanation. Because Uriel had big round eyes that could see just about everything, he thought he he was thought to be very wise. But Uriel had to admit he had no idea what happened. Then Mulian, the eagle hawk, jumped up. He took a stone and threw it into the river. The stone hit the water and disappeared. That is what happened to Cockatoo, said Mulian. As far as we are concerned, he has disappeared. It is, a, it is as though he had never been. So they're talking about the traditional idea of death there as you die, you go into nothingness, nothing happens. That's that. That's that. that they've disappeared. They have gone. That's what happened to Cockatoo. He's gone. You won't see him again. Then Wan, the crow, jumped up. He took a piece of wood and threw it into the river. The piece of wood disappeared for a moment, then rose to the surface and was carried away downstream. That is what happened to Cockatoo, Wan said. As far as we are concerned, he has disappeared, but he will reappear in another place. And that is ecological changeabilities in consciousness. And that is a potential for what will happen to us after death. And that is a very, very, very powerful dreamtime idea. So that was the idea in Dreamtime. 
So, moving back to Zen again, we're now on an hour and a half. This is a brilliant video, isn't it? So long and convoluted and complex and just yeah, all over the place. But bugger it, we're going for it. So, Zen, getting back to Zen. Well, let's talk about the Br Br Brumar story. I promised you that story for a minute from the King and the Corpse. And I don't remember all of it. My memory is terrible. We are, we've established this through this video. I do not have a memory. I do not know how to pronounce names. I do not know how to pronounce certain concepts from various different traditions. I am very terrible with my pronunciation, especially if it's Latin, but we're not going to get into that. So, Brumar, he is sitting in meditation and he's in, within his depths. He's within his, this sort of very, very pure awareness of uh, meditation. And Brahma is the creator god in Hinduism. And what springs from his depths is there's other gods sat round him or near him. And all of the things within the creation are Brahma's creation. Vishnu lies uh, in the uh, cosmic ocean. And a lotus springs from Vishnu's uh, belly button and flowers out and produces a Brahma. And Brahma then creates the, the divine play, the world, let's say. But, so just to give you, that was just to give you a bit of background on, on that. But Brahma is sat in this real meditative state. And we got some gods are around him. And suddenly a, a sort of form springs from the, the nothingness, the depths of Brahma. And whatever Brahma thinks of gets created. So he thinks of this woman. This woman comes to him called Dawn. And she gets created. And she's a beautiful woman. Absolutely beautiful woman. And anyway, after a moment, they're discussing this and all the rest of it. But after a moment, Dawn kind of wakes up in a way, slightly, subtly, Brahma from his complete meditative state. And anyway, Brahma starts to sweat. And this is this, the story of the creation of the, the god of uh, love in, in Hindu. It might not quite be the god of love, but it's... I think karma is the god of love. Yeah, it might, it's either god of love, god of sex, or something like that. It's, it's around that anyway. So anyway, Brahma starts to sweat. And uh, this is, of course, from the presence of dawn, you see. And from the sweat, different gods are created because he's a creator god whatever he does he just exudes creation he has to create it is what he does so um karma comes out from the sweat and karma is the as i say the god of love and i want to just i'm not going to tell you about the whole story because i don't remember it, if i'm being honest but uh, this is the bit that's interesting to me because again, it sees this idea of these mythologies all uniting up and linking up, which is very interesting. So karma comes out, and uh, and so there's this being that gets created along with many, many other gods. Now, karma goes for a bit of a uh, period of delusions of grandeur, actually, for a while. He wants to kill Shiva in the rest of this story, and he tries to go off, and I'm going to... You know, he was he, 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 a bit, like, spirited, you know. Like I said with the young people in Dreamtime about how they shouldn't get... Young people shouldn't get spiritual knowledge because they're too spirited or all that stuff. So it's a similar kind of vein. Um, but karma gets created. It's K-A-M-A. -A, so it's like ka kama. It's like kama. It's probably pronounced something different than karma. Um, probably like kama. And... Um, he, he actually has a bow and arrow, like Cupid, which is interesting. So I wanted to draw upon the link between, in this story, just there of the creation, between him and Cupid, the Roman, the Roman god, and Eros, which is Cupid in terms of a Greek god. And it's interesting that these mythologies unite in such a way. I and mean, we've got these parallels in these stories of these gods who are actually practically the same um, that, that all come together. And whether we've got a diffusionist argument, or whether we've got this argument of the fact that, well, maybe someone from Greece went over there or someone from over there went over there and therefore they founded the gods that way or whatever. And that's how we got to understand that there's different gods in different traditions, but they're actually the same. 
or practically the same, you know, or whether it is that they were independent of one another and they arose mutually. It's probably a fact, actually, in that case, that it's diffusionist, uh, especially when we're talking about the time scale, the, the Upanishads, I think, maybe 1,400, 1,800 years ago, something like that. It's very likely that people have, have been over there at that point, but to, to some extent, um, yeah, it's very, I would say it's very likely at that point. So it's probably di diffusionist. Um but it's a very interesting story. It's, a, it's a quite a nice story, and I wanted uh, the only reason I wanted to highlight it was because of this idea of the, of things creating from the depths. This idea of Brahma, whatever he thinks becomes a reality. That's got law of attraction vibes again. You see, we we uh, when we manifest something in the law of attraction. Not I'm not saying I particularly do this, although possibly certainly a little bit. But when we manifest something like that, and we put in the work for it. We, we attain it and we get it and so it comes out of the depths, it comes out of the unconscious and it's very interesting. And of course I wanted to highlight the uh, similarities between the, the gods as well, the Roman and the uh, Greek god and, and the, the Hindu god there. So moving back to Zen again, we've had these experiences, we've, we've we're moving on our path and we've had a lot of great doubt and we've we've maybe got familiar with some of the koans in the sense that we're trying to work them out and we're every single day we're thinking about that solely the vessel is hermetically sealed in alchemical terms and what that means in spiritual terms is that your focus your energy your drive is all on the magnum opus is all on the attainment of satori in in japanese in enlightenment or the attainment of moksha the attainment of this thing this ultimate knowledge the vessel is sealed and it's not going to be opened until we've attained this knowledge you have to go through the entire process so of course you you are compelled you are dragged, you are lifted up as well at the same time. It's all these things all coagulated into one. It's weird. Um, and uh, uh, you, you're constantly thinking about this. Think, 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 think. And I have a little quote from one of my poems called Think, think, think while having existential angst to drink. And it's not necessarily related to the concept of Zen or anything, but it's kind of somewhat indirectly uh, applicable here. So, um, you know, we we have all this thought, and for me personally, it was watching Alan Watts for God knows six, seven hours a day some days, uh, and, and after watching him, thinking about him, thinking about him, thinking about what what did he mean by this? What did he mean by that? What did he mean? Literally, hours upon hours, 12 hours a day, when I was doing reselling work, I would be thinking about these things. I was like, do it for, for days upon days, months upon months upon months. And so we then maybe, as I say, we get, we've, we've maybe got this Kensho experience, this spiritual awakening first off, and then some of the koans reveal themselves to us. And we think, yes, we're, we're through. Da -da -da. Yay, this is good, we're through. So you think, oh yeah, so uh, what is the first and last word of Zen? Well, Zen is unconceptual, so... Uh, there, there isn't a first or last word of Zen. Way, boom, I got you down. And you know, you, you're all like that. You're, you're in the little delusiony period of like, yes, I'm, I'm brilliant. Me, I'm, I'm all Zen. I'm brilliant. I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm now brilliant, and I'm the best in the world at all these things. You know, all that sort of stuff. And with me, that was incredibly um, apparent in terms of the delusions, not the fact I'm best in the world at anything. God knows, I'm not bloody best in the world at anything. Bloody crap at drawing, and I really want to be good at drawing, but I'm crap at it. Um, but no, uh, the delusion is definitely present. So, uh, you know, you get those and you think, oh, yeah, no, no. But uh, there's some that you don't quite get. You, you, you don't quite get certain cons and, and you, do, you may delude yourself for a time that you've got it all and you're all this and all the rest of it because you've attained this little experience and you're like, ah, yeah, this is good. Um, but then you continue after that and you're continuing divulging in things. For me, next was the Taoist and the Zen idea of purposelessness, the attainment of purposelessness with purpose. Uh, and that trapped me for a good month or two before I realized again that it's about the unconceptual. 
and about the attainment of purposelessness through the purpose of words and the fact that purposelessness, I mean, this is an intellectual answer. It's not a Zen answer by any means, but it's an intellectual answer to a Zen koan. Um, it's the attainment of the meaninglessness of language through, lang through the purpose of language itself. So you attain purposelessness through purpose. Um, I mean, there's also probably links to physiology as, there, as well there. The purposelessness of things that Alan Watts touches upon, like burping and farting, but it's through the purpose of your physiology. So it could be angles that we could see from an intellectual viewpoint, at least, with that. So then there was, of course, that. There was a lot of wu-wei for me after, after the first experience I had. And I was on wu-wei for... Oh, a good, good long time. <laughs> Jesus, a good long time with that one. Jesus, won't drop that one. Bloody bastard. Anyway, no, but it does. It is in a get you. And, um, and then, uh, after that, you, you start to get your koans. And the most recent one, I, I, it was only three months ago. I was walking down the street and, uh, I never knew this koan. I never got it. And I didn't realise I hadn't got it. You may, you may say that's quite Zen of you, but it wasn't that it was Zen of me. It was just that I kind of forgot. About, well, you know, I just forgot about it and I wish I'd actually realised it, but bugger it. Anyway, I was walking down the street and uh, I, I remember this koan. I remember this koan. Uh, the goose out the bottle koan. So uh, the idea that you, uh, the koan goes something like this, the story, it's not really a koan, it's more of a story, a zen story. But the story goes like this, now Alan Watts says it in a different way, now I don't know where he's found this particular story, or this particular version of the story, or whether he's putting it into modern uh, speech, for ease of understanding, right? But it's very easy to understand anyway, even in this version of it. So there's a woman, or there's a man, who has a, a goose, has a little baby goose or whatever it is, puts it in a bottle and it grows like within the bottle a little bit. We're assuming it's a fairly sizable bottle. And uh, the goose grows in the bottle and we say, right, get the goose out alive without breaking the bottle or without harming the goose. Something along those lines, right? Of course, it, it's an impossibility. You're not going to intellectually solve that co-op. But anyway, I'm walking down the street on a walk. I'm like, the goose, the goose is out. And I realized what it is, is it's the ability to forget. It's the ability, and, and I had already, even way prior to three months ago, I had been having this forgettery in Zen, the forgetful experience of Zen, as I like to call it, for months upon months upon months, like two a year or two by this point. But I still hadn't worked out the bloody koan. And it spontaneously came to me. It wasn't an intellectual uh, idea that I thought, oh, yes, the goose is out. It was a spontaneous experience that made me realize that's what the goose is. That's the goose is out. Now, the story that Alan Watts tells is of this, I think it's an army officer. And he's going to see a Zen master. The army officer comes in and the Zen master says, uh... You have a goose in a bottle. You've got to get it out, but you can't get it out by either harming the goose or breaking the bottle. And then the, the story that Alan Watts tells is the Zen master goes to the window and he's talking about something outside and moving on with the conversation. And the army officer, in quite a Zen way, carries on with the conversation, just leaves it at the door, this, this goose idea. Maybe he's thinking about it a little bit, but he, he, he kind of moves on as the conversation moves on. Then after this little, uh, parla, parla, no, that's not right. I can't say that word. Little conversation between the two. Um, they, he basically, uh, goes out the room. The, the, the army master is was just about to walk out the room. And then the Zen master says, the goose is out. And what that means is the flow. The army officer has flowed with the doubt, has flowed with the thoughts, has flowed with experience of what was demanded of experience, and it hasn't been hung up on a thought. Now, 
to understand that intellectually isn't enough. You won't, it doesn't matter. I've told you there intellectually, but you won't get it if you don't get it. But if you get it, you'll get it, you see. But what actually is the case is you have experiences in which you can just let go of the past. Like really, like not, not just, I don't just mean like the past in terms of past memories, but I mean even in a, in a present moment setting where you're talking about something, something comes up and then you can just flow and get rid of it. And then it's like you just flow with thoughts, flow with experience. And it's incredible. It's incredibly powerful. And you get more and more awareness of it and you can start to uh, hone your awareness. So everything just lets go. And it's like this blissful experience of just flowing and flowing and flowing. And it, it's just incredible. Even things that come in that are maybe previously you would have been anxious about or you would have been this about or would have been that about. They just flow. They just go. And it's incredible new flow of experience. So then that's another experience. That's another koan. And bear in mind, that was three years yeah, for about three years after I had started with Zen and koans and spirituality. Now, it was, it took me 10 months of listening to Alan Watts, 10 to 12 months of listening to Alan Watts every day and thinking every day for 12 hours a day. No joke, about 10 to 12 hours a day. The vessel was bloody hermetically sealed. Do, 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 fought, 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 trying to understand the concept, concept of enlightenment, trying to understand all these different things that ultimately you never understand fully anyway. All this folly took me 10 to 12 months of that and I got my Kensho experience. But it was two years, well, 18 months to two years after that, that I realised this particular koan. And that was, as I say, about four months ago now. So these kind of early experiences, they're very... No, I, I don't want to say fleeting, but they're very misleading. And we've got to continue our awareness, continue honing down this awareness in experience. Doesn't mean you don't have to be a person. Doesn't mean you don't have to be an intellectual. Doesn't mean you have to go on the top of a mountain and be a hermit and cross your legs and do all these random meditation poses. You can perfectly fine live out your normal life in society without even doing meditation specifically, but just with flowing with the thoughts. And that in itself is a form of meditation. Um, that's, that's all that needs be. You don't need to do any of these weird things, but it's simply about training your awareness. Now, of course, I went down the path of uh, yana, like the, uh, the path of knowledge, in the Hindu path of knowledge, the path of saying, who am I? And I've questioned myself on that for many years. Um, and so I went down that path, which is a scholarly path to, to, um, awakening or enlightenment or to moksha or to Tory, whatever. But there's other paths, like there's, there's different paths, like there's the path of action and then there's a the path of yoga and these kinds of things. And it just depends what, what one you go down. Um, so we've got to be careful because Zen isn't just this thing that's this, you know, you get these experiences and, and that's that. It's a long process. It's a training of your awareness and it's a growing into yourself as well. From a Jungian idea of what Zen means, it's a psychologically, it's growing into, um, a person who is complex free. You don't have any complexes left in your psychology or very, very few. It's growing into a person who is spiritually mature because of that. It's growing into a person who's well-rounded, well-balanced. Um, it's growing into a person who is not doubtful. Um, there's no great doubt left. Um, and it's growing into, in a way, it's growing into a man or an adult. Uh, let's not use the word man, let's use the word adult to be more holistic. But it's growing into an adult, and that's that's what it is. Um, but you, you've got to be careful of Zen because it gets rid of any sort of rules. Because what we've got to understand is I, rules are ideas. Rules have their 
orig origin in ideas. From a Jungian perspective, ideas are the anima, and the animus is almost in a way born from the anima. The societal rules, the societal structures are born from the ideas and are converted into spirit. We first have the ideas which are the anima, the soul, and from that is pulled out the the spirit in the sense of the, the spirit is the thing that utilizes the ideas to create rules and therefore society is created from that and uh, the, the dominance of society is the masculine, is the, the rules, is the, the animus. Uh, and just like with all these mythological traditions, wherever you go, there's always these, uh, there's always these, um, what's the word? Rituals, let's say, that go along with overcoming the child of the society uh, and becoming a man in that, in that sense or becoming a woman. And uh, so what happens in these rituals is that there'll be some sort of figure, some sort of dark figure in, in the form of a man. Uh, if it's like a, a very primitive tradition, the person might be wearing a mask or wearing some sort of clothing or whatever. Uh, there's very, very weird things actually. There's so many, many weird traditions. In some traditions, uh, in some cultures, they like pull people's hair out for, for the growing into adulthood. I, I forgot what that symbolizes actually, but it may be a kind of rebirth. You shave the hair of the child off to grow back the, in a way, the mane of adulthood, you know, like the mane of a lion. I mean, it could be something that I'm just hypothesizing. I don't know whether that is exactly what it symbolizes, but it seems quite logical that that could be one symbolism to draw from the actual context of the ritual. But we have all these rituals that help us overcome the the father figure of society, because that's what society is, it's a father figure. It's like God. God is a father figure. And it, it's in overcoming the societal father figure that then allows you to be someone who can create things in society and can rejuvenate society with fresh ideas and a new understanding because you're not under the tyranny of the father, the society anymore. Because when you're under the tyranny of the father, you won't be creative. You won't be, you won't be able to express yourself fully because you'll always be the child underneath the father. So when we transcend this, there's a lot of generative things to be gained. Uh, and it's also the case when we unify the anima and animus and we unify our personality um, in some sort of wholeness. There's a lot of generative elements to be gained. But within Zen specifically, we gain the ability to do what we want because we then know that society is all bollocks. We know that all these ideas are all bollocks. We know that every single thing that anyone ever says to us is merely just some sort of comment on reality that doesn't really have any weight to any true understanding of uh, what the universe is in its entirety. Never, it'll never get to that. Because basically the individual part to the overall whole of the universe, the individual part could never understand the, the magnitude of the whole. It's just logical. A little part can't understand the entirety of the whole. It just doesn't work like that. But it certainly can replicate the ideas of the whole. Um, but we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we are grounded and we have to make sure that we don't go over the top with with things and we don't go too far with things um, and that we can ground ourselves as people within society that have spiritual maturity and that understand uh, certain esoteric knowledge but that we use that in the correct way and that we use that in a cooperative way and that we use that in a way that better society uh, morally, if you want, um, or whatever it may be. We, we use the fact, this is the ultimate thing, 
we use the fact that we know rules and ideas and all this stuff are bollocks to be able to refine and to make good rules. I know it's kind of paradoxical because you think, well, hang on a minute, you've just got rid of all these rules uh, and then you're saying, well, let's make new rules. But that's what it is because society always has to continue. It's always going to have to go on. There's no point in us all just saying, right, bugger it, we're not going to live with society. Society is a powerful thing. It works. Of course, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect, but it works. It's the best system we have. It's like democracy. It's the best system of government except for the other systems of government, the famous Churchill quote. But it works, you know, uh, so we use it. And so we have to use it. But we have to have strong, intelligent, independent individuals who can come through, who can understand society as, as it sits and transcend it and then look at these rules of society and reorganize them and, and also add potentially some ideas to it and then make it better and this is the growth of a civilization this is the growth of a society this is the growth of proper uh, order within society proper morality and it is the growth of fundamentally a strong and also we, we've got to know a happy society um, and so we need that and we need to take note of that. We need to take stock of that um, rather than, let's say, it being um, something that people get certain knowledge and then they just run wild and they're just all over the place and they're just screaming in the streets because they're uh, spiritually Im immature. Or um, as I like, uh, I like the Alan Watts phrase from this, theologically, well, they're not theologically advanced. That's a very, a very interesting phrase um, in the sense that they're not really very well read on uh, mysticism, spirituality or theology and you know, religion and, and philosophy as well. Um, so therefore, they can't contain the knowledge that they get from the spiritual experience. It's a very, very interesting phrase, actually. But yeah, as I was saying, just to finish, because I, I didn't actually talk about this a second ago, but there's this idea, uh, obviously, I mentioned how the microcosm, the individual, can't ever have the uh, understanding of the macrocosm, the whole, the universe, um, because simply, logically, it just it doesn't work like that. There's an interesting thought moving forward from that as well, that the macrocosm, it's in hermetic philosophy. It's in the Hermetica, actually. Um, the Hermetica is... Basically, it was authored by a guy called Hermes Trinsmugescus. I can never say it. Uh, Thrice Great Hermes, anyway, it translates as. And uh, there's some debate whether this originates from... Uh, well, no, actually, these days in modern scholarship, there's no debate where, where it originates. Some people used to think used to like to have the wishful thought that it originated in Egypt about 3,000 years ago and that there was this great sage in Egypt who created this document, a document which was incredibly spiritually advanced and that was the one true great philosophy and it was created in Egypt 3,000 years ago and wow that's incredible to think that that was the case. But it's since been really debated and kind of found out among scholars that it was created in around the 1st to 3rd century in the in Alexandria. And of course, we all know the famous uh, library at Alexandria and a time of great kind of um, intellectual pursuit. But of course, it ended up going uh, and then you got the Dark Ages, which weren't actually Dark Ages. You know, it's, it's a redundant phrase, Dark Ages, because we did still have a lot of uh, kind of intellectuals in that period. Um, we even had like, you know, physicians and people like that in that period. We had, we had a lot. We had things going on. It wasn't like this, this period that was completely dead and it was like a wasteland. It's a terrible name for it, Dark Ages. But well, then, of course, start, starting with the Latin translations of certain things and getting into the 14th century, the early part of the 14th century, especially when we consider like Dante and the Divine Comedy and th things like that. About 13, what was that? Was that 1320s, 1330s, something like that? Anyway, I think Dante 
was either born or died in 1333. I can't remember which. I think it was died. I think he died in 1333. It's brilliant if you've not read the Divine Comedy. Oh my god, it's a, a genius piece of poetry. Anyway, um, so uh, then obviously we have the Renaissance and, and then, you know, these Latin texts started to come in and um, and, and then we got on and then and ended up getting science from that and et cetera, et cetera. And we know the rest of the story because I've talked about it in another, very briefly in another video. But the Hermetica around that time, you know, in terms of like first, second, third century uh, AD, I don't, did I just say BC? If I did, I apologize, I meant AD. Um, obviously it was written around that time. It's still an old text, of course, still sort of similar to the Bible and, and particularly I think Book of Revelations might have been about 80 AD. Um, by John, I forgot the, the name, the rest of his name, but he was named after an island, actually. I think it was an island that he was imprisoned on. But anyway, uh, it was around, you know, it was not much after that sort of time. So it's quite an old text, really, if you think about it. And um, it says all about the the Zen uh, ideas in it, really. The, the, so there's a, in Zen, because Zen came over to Japan, I said in the last video in the 12th century, it was really like the 13th century. You could argue that maybe it was over there in, in the late 12th century, but it was like really more the 13th century because Dojin, the, the Zen master, I think he was born in 1200 and died in 1254, 1255, something like that. Sometimes I get my dates slightly wrong. Um, but he went over to Japan, you see. So it's on the cusp. It's like 12th, 13th century. Um, but there's this idea in 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 uh, Buddhism particularly and also in Zen but it's uh, well actually no I'm wrong it is in Zen it is an idea in Zen but actually more so it originally originates in Buddhism now there's a guy called Bodhidharma who in the first century AD uh, introduced Buddhism to China and that's where it grew out of and then into and then it got you know Mahayana and Favado and all these kind of different sects and then you had um, Zen, Chan Buddhism and then Zen in the 13th century. So there's this idea and it's called uh, Gigi Muge. In fact, it, it is more of a Zen concept because Gigi Muge is Japanese and there's not really, as far as I'm aware, a direct, perfect translation of Gigi Muge. And it's J I hyphen J I hyphen M E uh no M U hyphen G E And it basically means the interrelation and interdependence of all different things together and therefore the the one whole because of that, because of all these kind of interrelations between everything. Um and it's similar to this idea that we see in the Hermetica by Hermes. Um, and uh, there's all this talk about God is one and that God should be pursued uh, not only through uh, certain philosophy and stuff like that, but it should be pursued and God should be found in science. God is not different from science, but it, it, it is science. God is science. And science is God in a way. And art is you know because there's this one whole everything is everything else you see everything is everything else so god is not different from science and there's this idea in mahmetica talking about the microcosm and the macrocosm again that the microcosm is a simply a smaller version of the macrocosm now there is this idea and i've forgotten which tradition it's in but there is this idea that um, the universe looks like the shape of a person. Alan Watts touched upon it. It's also in one of Joseph Campbell's books. I think it might be The Inner Reaches of Outer, Outer Space, but don't quote me on that. It might be The Hero's Journey. Sorry, not The Hero's Journey, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's one of those two books, but he has a picture of this in, actually. And it's from one of the ancient traditions. Uh, I have a feeling, but don't, again, I can't say for sure, but it might be an African tradition. 
or if it's not an African tradition, maybe an Indian tradition. Um, and so the, the microcosm is a smaller version of the macrocosm. Now, let's get rid of the idea that the universe is shaped like a human. It doesn't really matter about that idea, but the representation of the mac microcosm in terms of their mentality is the same as the mind of the macrocosm, the mind of God, let's say, or the mind of the universe, um, but just on a smaller scale. Well, how do we know this? The universe comes into creation. What is before the universe? We don't know. I've talked about it before in terms of virtual particles or maybe there's some just complete nothingness or maybe there's something before the universe, whatever it may be. But the universe comes into existence for all intents and purposes, in our view, from nothingness or from unconsciousness. So it comes into existence and, and it almost as if just before it comes into existence, it's like this thought of it, and then it comes in. There's, there's nothingness, and then it comes into existence like this. It sparks from this kind of macro unconsciousness that is exactly the same. It's not different, if you think about it, from the point in which a thought gets placed in our mind from our unconscious. Imagine we've got the universe. Nothingness before the universe, right? Let's say that. Nothingness. Very, very widely held scientific idea. Nothingness before the universe. Then this thing just comes out of nothingness miraculously. Just as our unconscious, a thought comes out of it. Spontaneously. Randomly. Just weirdly. It just comes out. Yes, okay, sometimes it's from external circumstance, but sometimes it's just from memory or from things just spontaneously that arise and it's exactly the same as that the mind of the universe or the flowing the way of the universe is exactly the same as the way of the micro microcosm exactly the way that we are and so that's why let's say in the idea of uh, this idea that we manifest ideas that we create an idea, we have an idea spontaneously, and we feel this compulsion to get it out there, an instinctual compulsion, no less. It's an instinctual compulsion. The, the, the instinct for constructiveness, or the instinct like I'm doing now for, well, I'm not really quite in the instinct, I'm partially in the instinct at this point. It's not like grabbing me incredibly. It was grab, grabbing me more incredibly towards the start of the video. But this instinct for inquisitiveness, the sage, if you will, um, and that's an instinct, and it manifests itself in reality. We have to do it, and it's exactly the same, only from a larger viewpoint as the universe, as the universe compelling itself into existence and creating all these forms of planets and galaxies and stars and humans and sheep and all these different things, and it's exactly the same. But the mind of the universe is infinitely more powerful than we could imagine as a part of it, as a tiny, tiny part of it. And so it can create things and it can do things that we can't dream of. But yet, we still have the power to be a small part of that, and we still have the power to exercise creation. We still have the power to exercise uh, certain compulsions upon reality that create things. And we are therefore our own contained little universe within the large universe. And that's a nice idea. That's a very nice idea. And uh, it also validates this idea when we when we link uh, cosmology and this, the idea of the universe and the, the nature of the universe with uh, our own uh, nature. It validates the ideas of instincts being powerful with, in us. Because you could say, well, there was an instinct for life in the beginning by the universe. Obviously, it's not some sort of spiritual thing like saying God is love and all that sort of stuff. Or every no, that's it. Everything is made of love. That's just a spiritual idea. It's a, you know airy fairy idea. But there's um, there is this compulsion for life, no matter what that may be, what what form that may take. Take in the beginning, the universe creates itself. There is a compulsion. There is an instinctual compulsion there for life. It's like it flows out. Now, of course, not instinctual in the way we perceive instincts in ourselves, but in a much more complex and uh, 
or maybe even much more simple way because we don't know we couldn't determine which but a, a different way a much bigger way than we can comprehend being just a part of the whole of this macro whole but there's this compulsion there and so we do the same we have these compulsions and we have these instincts and then we become socialized in a specific specific setting and we have our differentiated brain that is um has directions towards doing certain things instinctually and so the socialization along with the differentiation of our brain ends up creating the flowering of the personality that we ought to be and it is in fact in the seed uh aristotle talks about no Lao Tzu talks about how it's genius uh, to, to see to see the creation or the pinnacle of something in the seed is genius. I'm getting that quote a little bit wrong, but it's it's about there. It's about there. Aristotle also makes a very good argument for the actualization of something um, before its potentiality or before its potential. So uh, you know a. a if you have an egg, then that's going to bear a chicken. It's going to actualize a chicken. And the actualization is presupposed in the genetic formulation of the egg, um, which is a very interesting idea. Um, and I talk about that in more depth because I can't remember fully the thoughts around that in Revelations of the Self, the book I'm doing at the moment. So it's very interesting this idea that the universe flowers in a certain way based on an instinct, some sort of instinct for life, for compulsion for life, and it flowers via all these causal chains, all these interrelated causal chains over a very, very extended time period that was once a singularity and that was once we were all held in a singularity in a potentiality for existence which actualized itself as we are now. So, imagine we were all once this singularity. We were all trapped in there, but just not existing. We weren't, we, we weren't existing, we were just an energy in this singularity. And then we blow out into all these causal chains, and there's millions and millions of these causal chains that blew out and created this very, very expansive universe. That we're all interconnecting to one another, but also that branched off from one another. And although there was still very subtle causal relationships, the causal chains down here that created these planets and the causal chains over here that created these dwarf stars or whatever or like red dwarfs and stuff they're very very separate but they're still interrelated by the fact that they all go, go back to that one singularity and so we've we've come out of this all these causal chains boom and it's going all over here until we get created on the earth and all these causal chains come in and out of each other. And what happens is some causal chains go off here, some causal chains go off here. And maybe these uh, are, in, in our terms, maybe these causal chains are concerning with rocks and with gas and with things like that. And so these all from the universe come back in and then they circulate around to, to form a planet and the rocks and the gas all come together to form the earth. And then it gets hot and it gets you know, there's ice there first, and then there's heat, and then there's all this sort of stuff. And then uh, in the primordial oceans, life is created 3.5 billion years ago. And um, all these causal chains that were um, very, 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 very micro-causal chains. When we are now, where we are now in the present moment, two individuals walk together down a street. Two of these tiny little micro chains that were at once uh, united uh, in the singularity, billions upon billions, 15 billion years ago, 14 billion years ago, they've separated and have gone all, all this way and done through all this energy and changed in energy and all this sort of stuff and then changed in energy for all these different animals, yet the energy's changed itself, differentiated itself all through this. And it's constantly changing, constantly renewing, constantly going into different things. And then these two individuals who were once there, present in the singularity together, uh, but obviously not existing, but the energy, what I'm talking about here is just the energy. Don't anthropomorphize this. I'm just talking about the energy. It's just an energy I'm talking about that, that goes out into the causal chains. 
But then humans arise and then these two people walk down the street and they meet each other and unconsciously they look into one another's eyes they look into one another's eyes and they unconsciously know they unconsciously feel this very very metaphysical idea that I know you I've seen you before I understand you from a very very basic nature of the universe you are the universe and so am I and I feel that unconsciously I don't feel it consciously I can't put my finger on it but with this weird feeling in the back of my mind of familiarity unconscious familiarity it's there but I can't I can't put my finger on it and it's because all that time ago you were in that same place and you were never separated truly because there was all these causal chains that went to one another and uh, that that is the universe and that is how we work. And we flower. We flower out in personality just as we flower out, uh, just, as, just as flowers grow and just as we go grow physiologically, we flower out a, per, a personality. Um, and our potentiality to do that is, is actualized and it comes from an innate process that also utilizes its socialization uh, within obviously the differentiation of the brain, the differentiation differentiation of the brain, the way in which that individual's brain works, takes the socialization and processes it in the way their brain understands. And so therefore, uh, that individual is always going to become something based on their differentiation in their brain, their instinctual differentiation of certain things that they have a compulsion towards and the socialization is going to be what i would term superficial socialization in which it simply creates uh some level of uh individual experience uh based on that actual very collective and innate instinctual drive and very very individualized and very very fine because each of us are very 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 fine individuals and so it is going to be very, very fine. Um, and so that's how we grow and we flower out and we are actualized as a person. Whether you want to or not, you will you will flower out and you will, you, you will blossom uh, to the point that you can blossom. Because certain people have the ability to blossom more than in other individuals. And I'm not putting that down at all because in Zen there's the idea of non-duality. And the uh, fact that you can't have black without white or self without other or whatever you want to term it. Uh, and therefore, what is uh, higher is exactly the same as what is lower. So it doesn't, that the higher and the lower complement and create one another. So when I say that, oh, well, someone may not blossom as highly as someone else, that's not at all um, a negative thing because we all have our place in this universe we all have our equal place and those people who are lower affirm the people who are higher and those people who are higher affirm the people who are lower you couldn't have higher without lower so we uh, so obviously certain people with a certain brain structure certain intelligence because of that a certain instinctual direction let's say like for myself I'm, you know i have more of a uh in quitting i'm not saying i'm intelligent i'm just saying in terms of the instinctual drive i've got an instinctual drive for inquisitiveness so that aligns with philosophy so therefore you can say well even despite my socialization i'm always because of my differentiated brain i'm always gonna take hold of information in an inquisitive manner first off and then uh, I'm going to pre present that information in a specific way based on the the cog cognition in my brain, the way my brain thinks. So um, it's it's very interesting, and and we all flower in this manner, just as a flower does. You, if a flower grows, and uh, so long as a flower is in the correct environment and gets its nutrients. It, you know, the sunlight, the water, the, the soil, all that sort of stuff, it's going to grow and it's going to flower. Just the same as if we are in our environment and we have food, we have water, we have certain things like that, we are going to ultimately grow into an adult and we're going to grow uh, personality-wise as well because, of course, our personality is 
created our mind is created from our brain and so if our brain develops physio like anatomically physiologically and grows into an adult then of course our personality has to as well just by default um now of course you're going to make the argument with me and say well adam what about all those people who uh, are you know become uh psychotic or become insane well i would say uh from a specific viewpoint, and, and it's a, quite a pessimistic one, unfortunately, but from a specific viewpoint, you could say that that is their flowering. Now, if we are to take the fact that everything's unconceptual and that we don't actually think that um, things are good or bad, because again, this is a good and bad are ideas that we've created, they're, they're, moral, they're, they're principles of morality. So if we are to think that, well, nothing's good or bad, being psychotic isn't a bad thing compared with being non-psychotic it's just we've defined that as a bad thing because we think oh that person's a little bit weird or a little bit crazy and we've got to also understand that being psychotic isn't a, a terrible thing it's got a terrible ring to the name there's so much gradient of of, of a psychosis or even a neurosis. There's many, many people who can function in society brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, and they have a psychosis or they have a neurosis. Um, and they're not at all harmful to anyone. There's so much stigma attached to that, and it really annoys me. I did a, uh, an essay on that last semester. Um, so it does annoy me quite how much stigma is attached around that. And we've got to get over that. But instead, if we look at it from a natural perspective, the tree grows. I've, I've talked about this idea in another video. The, in a forest, you've got trees and some of them just grow in a certain weird way. And it, and it makes the forest. The fact that we've got, obviously, these tra trees that go straight and then we've got also these trees that grow crooked. If you had all perfectly straight trees, you'd be a bit bored going through a forest. You'd be like, oh, there's... Not much character here, they're just all perfectly straight trees. There's something about perfection that daunts us, that makes us feel it's not quite right. And that's that, I think, is to be put down to the fact that we're imperfect in our nature. And so anything eerily perfect kind of makes us think, ooh, that's not quite nice. I don't like that particularly. And it's for good reason. Um, so, But when we go into a forest with all this eeriness and there's some straight trees and there's some like slightly crooked and there's some that have grown over this way and over that way and over the other way it's exciting it's interesting it makes it so in my view um although we may say in this idea of actualization as a more of an innate process and an instinctual process and that things happen in a certain way um that maybe some people are gonna flower in some sort of what we could term or what I've termed in the past negative individuation or negative unconscious individuation um like the you know the attainment of a, a specific uh, personality that is individualized and that is you and that is very um cemented in in your actualization um we could say that some individuals are to be actualized in such a way as being psychotic. Now, there's other individuals who are to be actualized based on their innate processes, based on their socialization, um, to be, to have a neurosis or to have a psychosis and then get over it. And that's a part of their kind of actualization. And so there's all these very, very fine individual chains that go off and that you know go this way and that way and the other way and it's very very gray and it's very very gra uh, gradiented so it's like a big 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 mine incredible fine gradiented system with all these individuals seven billion of them on here and they all go off in their little ways and there's all these different things that can happen um but ultimately we we get we get to the level of development that we are um specifically meant to get to so long as we have the water, the food, etc. Because of the innate instinctual drives within us, compelling us to be who we are, compelling us to get to that level of development. And um, therefore, it's just like a tree or a flower or this. Of course, if you don't have the correct environment, for example, you don't have food, I mean, the basic physiological environment that you need to actually grow, then, then of course, you die. You don't get there. Um, and you don't get to that, in a way you don't get to that potential, but in another way you do, because it's quite right, 
it's quite right, I know it's not a very nice thing to say, but it's quite right that you died because you didn't get the nutrients that you needed, uh, and therefore from a causal perspective, from a scientific perspective, you know, obviously you, you were going to die, and that's how it is. Um, and then we could even make the argument that the actualization of those people, because of the interrelation and everything on planet Earth, and the fact that that Cause, causal chain was always going to end up in that position based on the fated nature of cause and effect because every cause creates a new effect and therefore every effect that becomes a new cause means that cause and effect of, of the entirety of time and space is actually one entity that isn't unbroken and that is actually condensed into a, a, a point of eternity that is therefore what we term in spirituality as the eternal now well not really what we term in spirituality as the eternal now but it could be condensed into that idea as well so if every cause is to become another if every effect is to become another cause and it's an ongoing chain like that so that, that's fated in the idea of as soon as you start a cause you have to have an effect that is fate you can't change that. That Therefore, that's fate. And if, as I say, that link continues on through time and space, then we have a oneness of experience there. Therefore, if all the causal chains from the universe go out like that, go in all different directions, create the Earth, then things happen on the Earth through all these causal chains like this, da -da 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 -da. then that person at that particular time who didn't have the correct food, who didn't have the correct environment, is fated to die and therefore it means that uh, that is their actualization that is their always going to be their actualization and uh, therefore that is in a very pessimistic and rather cruel way their blossoming is to die which is really horrible but that's how it is as far as i can see as far as and trust me i i, I go into these things deep i i plow down with my philosophical hat i'm not like nietzsche and probably bloody have a mallet but god i just like boom boom i'm getting to this and i'm making sure that i know fully i you know the philosopher is someone terrible because they're very hell-bent on finding truth and truth it's arguable by different philosophers argue whether truth is actually attainable or whether it's not attainable um but you want to get to truth so you get there and you get there and you take out take down as much as your own wishful thinking as possible i still partake in a little bit of wishful thinking sometimes i try and recognize when i'm doing so and get over it and try and be logical about things i'm more of a logician than anything i kind of like to think of myself as the last great logical met metaphysician because there's no message philosophy is a field now that's just absorbed in science and there's no wonder in philosophy anymore you can't you can't be like me on this video no one's a philosopher like me on this video not many people anyway because most people oh well we have to make sure we're doing philosophy in this nice rigid way no philosophy is meant to be fun it's meant to be like i wonder what this is i wonder what that is i wonder what the other is let's think about it like a child would let's think about what what we can observe what we can get out of these things um but anyway, the philosopher is quite stern with the idea of truth, and so I try and get through to truth all the time, and uh, and so I've been through this so rigorously, and I know, I feel it so much that these, this is the case, but I also have to be very, very careful of that knowing, because I become rigid, I become unflexible, and if I become unflexible, then of course, um, I, I, I'm no good as a philosopher. We have to get rid of our neurotic attachment to the ideas that we've formulated in our own philosophical stance and we have to replace that with a firm and uh, very, very flexible moving in the wind with all these other philosophical ideas and allowing them to come in and to to give us newfound understanding that may be contradictory to our own understanding, but we need to do that. We need to go down that very hard process of realising that there's certain things that actually aren't right in our own philosophy to get to a level of uh, superior understanding. And that is the philosopher. That is what the philosopher means. To be living in truth, living in centre, and try to get as best you can. And that's why Zen is brilliant for the philosopher, because if we understand Zen, 
if we understand the um, process of Zen and it's not non-attachment to ideas then of course uh, we can we can start to get rid of we start to step back we can start to be in line with the unconceptual and we can um, start to center ourselves again and, and understand where we are so anyway we've been on for two hours and 20 minutes right now my throat is killing me now at this point I've, I've not had much of this coffee it'll be it'll be cold now Oh. Right, let's just have a rest for a minute, just chat about something mundane. Oh, I'm getting a new microphone. Um, now, I understand, I, I apologise about the microphone. This room is echoey. I've tried to get the settings as best as I can. I've tried everything I know. I don't know anything other how to do it. Tried all these different filters and stuff. I can't do it any better than it is. Um, I've gone on Premiere Pro and I've created a preset for a noise reduction filter. And I'm hoping that that works for some of these videos and it maybe just reduces that echo a little bit. I do apologize if it isn't brilliant. I do apologize that if sometimes when I'm raising my voice, it starts to seem a little bit echoey. Um, there's nothing I can do. The only thing I can do, and which I will be doing, is I am getting a mic for my birthday. It's my birthday in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I'm going to get a Shure microphone, you know, those really nice ones. I've wanted one for years, but they're like 250 quid for a microphone. And I might even need to get a new stand, because I don't think this stand will work. It might do, it might not. I'm not, I'm not certain yet. But if I, get, I need to get a new stand, then... I probably want to get a good stand because I may as well get a good one if I'm getting a good mic, right? So um, if I get a good stand, that might, I don't know how much they are, actually, might be it might not be too bad, it might only be 20 or 30 quid even for a good one. Uh, and that, you know, that's a pretty good one, but I don't I don't know, I don't know, I'd have to look on Amazon. Um, but I am getting a new mic. Now that one, because it's a sure one, it should reduce any echo. I'll still probably do the noise reduction on Premiere, just so that then we can really filter it out. But the reason I want a new mic is because, you know, I'm doing these poetry videos. Well, because I'm doing these poetry videos, I, I just don't like this mic. Oh, God. I'm going to burp. Excuse me. Um, but basically, I don't like this mic. I, 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 there's that little bit of echo in it. And I'm hoping that when I get the new mic, there won't be that little bit of echo. Of course, I'm only in this room for another few months. And then it'll be summer. And then, obviously, I'll be getting a new place. So... Uh, the new place shouldn't be as echoey at all. I've, uh, obviously, I've seen the new place and uh, it should be okay. Although we haven't sorted it yet. I need to sort out something else. I need to sort. Uh, I really need to get the others in, in gear. You see, I, I've, I've done my part. I've done all the part I can do with, with the, the house, with securing the house. But the others are a little bit kind of relaxed with it. And, you know, but anyway, we'll, we'll whip them into shape and we'll, we'll get there. Mm. I don't think I've had any, had any breakfast today, actually, but it'll make my lunch more satisfying, won't it? So there we go. So I'll leave it there, guys. Thank you very much for joining me on this rather long video. It was here. It was there. It was everywhere. It was brilliant. It was lovely. It was nice. I enjoyed it. Uh, I feel satisfied. I feel my hunger for philosophy is satisfied for a moment. Uh, yes, literally a moment. You might be thinking, oh God, he's done a two and a half hour video. How can how can it not be satisfied for more than a moment? But me and philosophy, well, she's like a, a, a wife, you know. Um, she's like heavenly Sophia, if you will. Um, she's wonderful. And all philosophers consider, well, I suppose all male philosophers, I should say, Maybe some female philosophers too um, consider philosophy as a woman, um, but it is. It's like this wonderful thing. It's this. It's got the enigmatic charm a good woman has. It's got this. Yeah, that 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 gets it. Enigmatic charm of a, that a good woman has. Because Alan Watts always says about the whole. Uh, philosophy of romance and of particularly the attraction between men and women and how the woman uh, can create a void 
and it, it, it gets a man excited and it makes him uh, pursue. Now, my particular feelings on that, because obviously I'm doing psychology and that's more of my, I say it's more of my main field than philosophy. You wouldn't think so after this video, but um, because I look at it from a psychological angle first, let's say, you know, I, I think there is definitely some truth in that. But I don't think it's the sole nature of man and woman. I don't think it's a sole attraction between man and woman. I think there is a woman can create a void quite often and it, it does uh, kind of make a man want to pursue and it makes a, him think that she's something uh, to be prized, as Alan Watts says. But um, I don't think it's just that. I think there is a lot more dynamic to the relationship between man and woman and, and no doubt Alan would have thought that as well. But... Um, it, it, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one, and, and so I think that philosophy does have that similar enigmatic charm that a woman can exude, oh, I can never say that word, exude, 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 um, at certain times, and, and that kind of feeling of, there's always something more to know, oh, but what's, what is it that is behind this, you know, that's the, the charm of philosophy, but anyway, I'll end it on that quite nice note, actually, that quite nice, um, I don't know, just that little, um, no, I don't know the word, anyway, um, that nice little lament to philosophy, but it's not a lament, because that's, that, no, that's not the word, see, I don't know the word, I forget these things, um, words, well, what are you going to do, <laughs> you, you can't do much for words anyway, can you, except, except speak, so, um, yeah, it was a nice little ending though. So I'll leave it there guys. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you no doubt in another video very soon. Uh, I've put some items on eBay. And we'll probably do a sales update and stuff like that. Because I have had a bid on one item already. So we should be able to do a sales update. If more than let's say four or five of them sell. Got about nine items on. Uh, nine or ten items. So yeah, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, and I will see you very soon. So see you very soon guys. Thanks for watching. Oh, if you made it this far as well, really thanks for watching. I mean, for God's sake, this is mental. Two hours and 26 minutes. That's like crazy. Anyway, I'll see you very soon, guys. Bye.